Good morning and thank you for joining us for the CABE uh, webinar for Webinar Wednesday for July 2017. Today's subject is designing to minimise the risk and impact of arson. So my name's Katie, I'm Digital Services Specialist at CABE and I'll be uh, moderating this morning's webinar so I'll be looking after any questions that you may have. If you want to get in touch with us today, you can. Uh, we like to make these an interactive event. So you will have a, a panel either on your right-hand side or at the top of the screen, depending on uh, the device that you're using to view this. Um, but somewhere within there, you'll be able to send us questions. You can type those in and just submit them, and they'll pop up on our screen. And what we'll do is we'll try and answer as many as we go, or we may leave some to the end if we've got quite a lot coming in on a very similar sort of area. We'll uh, perhaps look at those collectively. So again, feel free to get in touch. You can also use the hashtag CABECPD on Twitter. We're also aware a lot of you do now watch these on catch up via our YouTube channel. So if you are watching this webinar um, via another means, for example, like I say, YouTube, but you still have a question and want to get in touch, you're more than welcome to. Just drop us an email, technical at cbld.com, with any questions with regard to today's content, and we'll obviously get back to you. So moving on to the speaker, the presenter for today is Kevin Blunden. He's our technical director, and he will be talking you through this subject matter. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Kevin to, uh, to pass on the information. Good morning, and um, welcome to this morning's webinar. Um, a quick apology, but I'm not sure how much of an apology it really is. Um, for some reason, my webcam just is not picking up this morning. It may pop up sometime during the webinar, because it is buffering, saying it's trying to connect. But um, fortunately for you, I think you don't have to stare at my um, image all the way through the webinar, which is probably good news. So this morning, we are going to look at how we design in relation to minimizing the potential for arson and what we can physically do in the design of the building to perhaps minimize the impact should arson occur. Um, I'm going to start with some statistics which I've gained from fire service websites and from uh, figures issued by the Department for Local Government and Communities. Um, and the first one is that in terms of arson, roughly 9% of the fires that occur within domestic properties are attributed to arson. And roughly 27% of all the fires in other buildings. And particularly um, some public buildings or schools in particular have quite a high prevalence of arson. And it is a serious concern, not only in terms of the management of the building, the impact on risk assessments for those who are responsible for the premises, but also for obviously the, the insurance sector, um, not only from a life safety point of view, from a, a business continuity and a property protection point of view. Um, some of the figures I stumbled across on the fire service website, which I think are quite staggering, um, which they attribute to government figures, are these sorts of things. So £40 million pounds worth of damage and cost, and this is all claimed to be attributable to arson. 20 schools damaged in some way or destroyed. Four churches damaged or destroyed. 1,600 attacks on property, 50 people injured, two fatalities, and it's claimed that's representative of what occurs in a single week, which, when I read those figures, to be honest, is quite staggering in terms of where we are and, and the, the issues we need to concern ourselves with. One of the big problems we have, though, is that when we start looking at designing buildings, um, we make some fairly broad assumptions in terms of fire safety design uh, so that we can actually come to a suitable conclusion. So, I mean, obviously, the first assumption is that all fire needs three elements. It needs an oxygen supply, an ignition source, and a fuel supply. And for most of our design concepts in trying to prevent a fire occurring in the first place, what we try to do is either remove the ignition source or remove the fuel supply, or where there's a particular um, risky fuel source, uh, keep it remote from ignition so that we try and separate those issues. There are very few locations where we can actually do away with the need for oxygen, so that really is a sort of a constant in the whole uh, equation. But in reality, one, we start to make some sweeping assumptions when we look at fire safety, and particularly our strategy for means of escape. And the first one is that, in general terms, most of our design standards in practice today 
only consider a fire starting in one location initially. As the fire develops, it may well spread. But the initial fire that we are planning our escape strategy from is considered to only start in one location. Now, obviously, um, part of that is because the strategy when we look at means of escape is to be able to turn your back on the fire, make your way to an alternative exit. And that relies on the fact that the alternative exit isn't always isn't also going to be obstructed by a fire. And whether it is or not in the case of arson really comes down to the motivation of the arsonist, arsonist and what they're seeking to achieve. Because it may well be that the determined arsonist may choose to set several seats of fire, which could potentially obstruct several alternative um, avenues for means of escape. The problem in terms of design is we can't really design for more than one fire in one location. Because if we consider one fire, and say that may obstruct an exit, well then we provide a second exit to give us an alternative. If we then have to consider two fires that are set by an arsonist, then we have to think about a third exit. And, you know, depending on how many fires the arsonist set, we could just keep on adding exits forevermore. So, in practical terms, we assume there's this one fire in one location. The second thing that all of the design standards tend to agree on is that fires don't start in corridors or staircases. They are considered as being inert areas um, and therefore minimal fire risk. They're not usually full of furnishings and they are considered to be a route that's still available to us in an escape. So they are a fundamental part of that strategy and as such we make this sweeping assumption that's not where the fire is going to start. But when we do look at instances of arson, particularly in things like um, flats and the like, quite often the arsonist starts the fire in the common areas with the, with the aid of an accelerant. And in something like a school accommodation, if the corridors include lockers, cloakrooms, etc., that can be one of the key areas where a fire is likely to start within those premises. So again, we make this assumption that our route is going to be available for escape, but it is to a certain extent flawed depending on how determined the arsonist may be. So, as I say, our basic principle to get people out of the building is to turn your back on the fire and make your way out. And from a design point of view, we still assume that's always going to be possible. When we're looking at arson, it is also worth considering what maybe drives people to set the fire. Now, um, I think possibly again because of the way these things are reported and particularly in, in the fictional world in terms of film and, and TV drama, the arsonist is quite often portrayed as um, a pyromaniac who sets fires just because they like to see fires. In real terms, uh, a lot of the motivation for arson is driven by something else. Um, it could well be it's a financial issue. Um, to look at uh, insurance claims or or um, something of that sort. It could be to cover up a crime. It be, could be because somebody has a grudge against a business or an organization or an individual. And quite often it's just one step further on from the sort of vandalism that we, we tend to see occurring. And because of this, um, we can start to see how to build a process in to deal with it. Now, if it is something that is being driven by revenge or vandalism, then there's a good possibility that we can try and defend our premises against those, those people who are likely to cause that in terms of arson. But if it's something being done to cover up crime or financial or business related, then it could actually be the people in control of the property who are setting the fire in which case it's very difficult to put precautions in to stop that occurring. So in looking at it, we have to identify the risks. And in reality, any um, fire risk assessment of a premises should take into consideration the potential for arson. And that would include not only the type of business and its profile, but also the area in which it's located, local crime rates, um, um, things like vandalism, to get a view on what's likely to occur and what might impact on the building. 
in looking at the risk as well, you'd have to consider, well, if I'm looking at those elements of the fire, the, the oxygen, the ignition source, the fuel supply, the one that's easily controllable in design and management of the buildings is maybe the fuel supply. And it can be simple things like making sure the refuse bins aren't actually up tight to the perimeter of the building, looking at vegetation. Now, vegetation is, is a, a two-pronged issue, if you like. You can put vegetation up to the face of the building to stop somebody getting in close proximity. But in periods like we've just had a prolonged hot, dry weather, that vegetation itself becomes the fuel source. We do have to consider the fabric of the building, particularly um, the external envelope in, the, in terms of how ignitable is that to somebody who's, who's up to mischief. And there's always going to be the potential of somebody using accelerants. What we have to consider in, in the design and management of the premises is that we don't leave those accelerants somewhere where they are easily available to somebody. And what we have to look at as well as this is then Ignition sources, it's highly probable the arsonist will bring with them. But the time factor, how long will somebody have to actually set a fire and, um, where before they're actually detected or somebody comes across them to prevent them doing what they're doing? So there is a time issue within there as well. So a lot of what we actually design in relation to arson isn't about tackling the fire in any different way or about planning a different means of escape. It can be the practical things of trying to stop somebody getting to our premises to actually set the fire in the first place. So if we take it from the furthest point in, the first thing to do is maybe look at restricting the access to the site um, that the building is on. Now, if this is a business premises or potentially a, a domestic premises, then that might be feasible. If it's a public building, um, it might be, not be as possible to restrict access to the premises. But the idea is to look at the access, look at perimeters, um, look at making sure that things like rainwater downpipes aren't positioned so that they're easily climbable, that people can't gain access onto flat roofs or the roofs of premises from adjacent properties. And even simple things like if there is perimeter fencing, if it's possible for somebody actually to drive a vehicle up to the perimeter, the potential is that they'll then use and climb on that vehicle to climb over the fence in a relatively easy way. And we also have to make sure, of course, that the more secure we make the site, um, we don't actually compromise the escape provision from that uh, site or the ability of the fire and rescue service to actually get in to deal with any incident that should occur. So the next stage, if they've got onto the site, the next thing is about securing the access into the building and looking at the security of doors and windows. Now, um, we do have to cons consider security, and if you look at the, lot of the design guides in terms of locking arrangements on doors, doors for means of escape need to be readily openable without, without a key or a bolt. If we've got electronic locks, we're looking at a locking arrangement that will um, fail to the open position should the electric supply fail to the door so that it can still be used for escape. All of those things are fine in the day-to-day -day operation when the building is occupied. An awful lot of buildings have to have a different level of security when they are securing overnight because obviously if you have electronic locks that fail safe so they fail to the open position when the power goes off or when the fire alarm goes off, you can't have the situation that somebody cutting the power means the doors are in the unlocked position. So you have to have some of the means in place. And that's all well and good, but there's that sort of transition stage when the commercial premises is fundamentally empty of most staff, but maybe there are two or three maintenance staff or cleaners on site um, where the escape is still needed, but ma vast majority of the building is unoccupied and, and detecting people walking around is difficult. Uh, a lot of emphasis and a lot of the, the recommendations on designing for arson on good external lighting and CCTV. Um, lighting will act as a deterrent if people think they are likely to be discovered. They are less likely to be, to be setting fires. CCTV is all well and good as long as it's monitored and recordings are stored somewhere that's clearly remote 
from the premises because obviously if, if the arsonist is successful and the building burns down unless the recording is in a fire resisting construction within that premises the cctv images may well have also been lost as part of the um the the issue the the fire so things like entrances and exits and windows it's ideal if they're overlooked and somebody can observe what's going on um and where it gets more complicated is maybe where you've got common parts of public buildings um corridors that are slightly out of the way retail areas where somebody can be for a while without being detected and where they can potentially set the fire. When we're looking at the, the entrances and the exits as well, it's not just a case of, of looking at how boat robust the locks are, um, because again, we do have to allow for means of escape. But it is also um, considering the, the minor details, simple little things like how big is the gap under the door? Um, Generally, in our fire strategies, when we're looking at fire-resisting doors, uh, we tend to think of a three millimeter gap between the door and the frame. But we tend to look at, in terms of general fitting of doors, something like a 10 millimeter gap under internal doors. And that quite often would apply to something like a flat entrance door as well. Well, it's quite easy with that, and, and even with external entrance doors that are designed for level access thresholds. Um, it's quite easy to end up with a small gap under the door that can be exploited either by pushing combustible materials underneath and then igniting them or by pouring liquid accelerants underneath the door. So the door needs to be as well fitting as possible with maybe some provision there to stop that sort of, of element happening. And again with things like letterboxes. Um, a straightforward letterbox that is open on the inside or even a letterbox with a cage on the inside to catch the, the, the letter and the post um, is all well and good, but it won't necessarily stop somebody putting something that's combusting through the letterbox. So maybe a fire resisting box on the inside or potentially even have a separate mailbox externally that doesn't then, that has to be emptied every day rather than communicating into the building is another issue that could be considered to look at the, the practicality of reducing the risk of arson. I mentioned just now that the issue of um, refuse and vegetation, and it's not just where the refuse is stored on a day-to-day -day basis, it's also where it is on collection days, or the, so when it's left out the night before collection. So the refuse may be stored within the building in a secureish location, but actually on collection day it's, it's there on the the perimeter of the building, or it could be in, in bins that are stored in close proximity. Fire started in here because it's a ready fuel source. Quite often, you know, the opportunist vandal setting fire to the bin. Quite quickly, the fire will spread up the facade of the building and maybe break in through the soffit and fascia. Um, and that can become a, a, an issue with that. Again, looking at the um, external facade, what that's actually constructed of, and restricting vehicle access. The other thing to think of in terms of external attack of the property is also the construction of the windows. Um, not necessarily looking at bars on windows, but whether actually windows are glazed in something like toughened glass um, or something of that sort, just to prevent somebody throwing Molotov cocktails or burning material through a window, um, which is another way, obviously, that people will quite quite easily look to start a fire if they're up to mischief. So again, looking at that and considering that sort of level of protection. I mentioned um, CCTV just now as a deterrent, uh, and it is, but obviously we've all seen the images on the, the TV on crime-related programs where there are images captured on CCTV that aren't particularly good because the quality of the image isn't particularly wonderful or the offender is, is you know, wearing a hoodie or a balaclava or a scarf across their face and it can be difficult to identify who they are. So you do have to look at the, the quality of an image, um, particularly not only in terms of how clear a face is going to be, but also if somebody's arrived by a vehicle in the locality, can it pick up number plates and things of that sort. It's important to make sure that the cameras are visible to act as a deterrent, but at the same time out of easy reach so that they can't be disabled by somebody 
looking at it. And as I say, look at where the, the recordings are monitored or stored. Um, obviously, technology is fairly sophisticated now. Cameras can come on on movement sensors, and they can send alerts. Um, and for instance, the CCTV that we have at the, the head office premises here, um, we can actually monitor on our phones whilst we're remote from the premises to see what's going on. So at least somebody's aware and, and capable of seeing what's happening. But where the recording is kept, because quite often a lot of these things will be a case of trying to examine the recordings at a later date, um, needs to be considered. And this is perhaps where cloud-based uh, systems with off-site storage are fairly essential. Again, all of these systems are all well and good, but they need not only a, a power supply, but also some form of backup, whether it's an alternative mains power or whether it's a battery backup, because obviously, again, if somebody were to disable the mains power to the building, it could um, effectively cut off all of the CCTV. So something to consider. Those are all measures, if you like, to look at how we design to stop the arsonist or deter the arsonist. Um, but we still have to face the fact that uh, a number of occasions these fires will, um, or the fire set by arsonists, they will be successful in what they're attempting to do. So we have to then consider what do we do to minimize the impact. And to be honest, what we find in our normal design standards for reducing the development of the fire in the first instance will still work in relation to arson. Um, it may just be that if we've concluded that there's a higher risk of arson for our particular building, that we may look to do a higher level of things such as compartmentation. The simplest way to restrict the development of the fire is to divide the building up into numerous little fire resisting boxes. And therefore, the fire should restrict to the box where the fire is, um, where the fire started. Or in the case of the arsonist, if there's several boxes affected, it should at least re restrict to those areas. What we then need to look at is, from a management perspective, the high value items, the critical business continuity items to put into fire resisting secure locations are remote maybe from the, the external perimeter of the building. So it's more difficult for the arsonist to actually set fire to those particular areas. Again, look at the key data and information to be backed up off site. And of course, the, the, the other thing that we're um, talking a lot about at the moment is the alternative to compartmentation, which is the use of um, suppression systems to restrict the initial development of the fire so that in reality um, we can contain it in a relatively small area. The other thing that links with this is particularly maybe an issue for commercial buildings or for public buildings is to actually look at the fire alarm system. The design standards we have uh, in the UK at the moment still enable an awful lot of commercial buildings to be built with a class M um, system or very little detection within the building. Um, and obviously a class M system, break glass, call points and like, requires a manual activation, a manual input. Um, it might be that if there's a, a higher potential for arson, that a um, automatic detection system is put throughout the building and linked to a monitoring um, source so that should the fire occur, somebody is actually aware of it. The, the problem with putting in uh, a, a compartmented building is if the fire alarm doesn't actually activate because nobody sets off a break glass point and nobody is aware of it, that compartmentation, whether it's designed for 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, whatever, will at some point break down. Um, and so in reality, if nobody was aware of the, the fire for 12 hours, the whole building could still be gone. Um, so if we have a detection system to a monitoring station that can verify the fires there and then call the fire brigade, at least it's likely to be responded to in a short time frame, and therefore there's more chance of saving the building. A lot of insurers now are looking from a, a business continuity perspective and a property protection perspective 
at looking at compartmentation levels over and above the design standards such as building regulations. Um, obviously building regulations to a certain extent is purely about life safety and the insurers are looking at other things like business continuity and contents. But for instance if you take a school premises where there's quite a high potential for arson, uh, most insurers now look for schools to have at least four compartments so that in the event of a fire you only lose one quarter of the building in the short term and that makes it much easier to recover because the main cost of recovering from a fire for a school premises is actually in the busing and transportation of children to other schools whilst the premises is rebuilt. If three quarters of the premises can be up and running again fairly quickly and some temporary classrooms then dropped on site a lot of those costs are reduced and obviously when the insurance sector look at risk, they, they are looking at the potential costs and how they can minimise from their point of view. Right, there's one question just popped in, it says other than the sprinklers, what do we mean by suppression systems? Um, some of the terminology is changing about suppression systems now, uh, the recent um, revisions to BS 9999 and 9991 talk about automatic water fire suppression systems rather than sprinklers to allow for um, high pressure water mist suppression as opposed to the traditional um, sprinkler that we're looking at. Some of these systems are designed to meet a standard, some don't necessarily, so you do have to look carefully at the manufacturers, but that's an alternative. Other premises uh, in terms of suppression tend to be more localized to particular risks. So you can have gaseous suppression systems, um, they tend to be more on your sort of data centers and electric risk. Um, you can have obviously localized um, suppression in things like the, the cooker hoods in ranges, but they're not necessarily an arson related system. But sprinklers in the traditional sense of, of a large volume of water are just one particular option. Water mist, because it's a finer particle, um, for the same volume of water you get about 200 times the surface area of water in a water mist because there's lots more smaller droplets which can aid in the cooling effect when it's dealing with a fire but it does have to be a design system to a standard it does have to be pressurized because otherwise the mist is light enough that given ventilation characteristics it will not fall in the direct pattern where it's intended to but there are increasingly more options and the reason people are looking at an option as opposed to sprinklers is obviously there is still concern about the potential water damage from a sprinkler system. Um, the other thing we do need to consider when we're looking at the effect of arson is to look at the means of escape and as far as possible if there is a high chance that your building is liable to be um, subject to arson look at the issue in terms of more than one source of fire. I talked right at the beginning about it. it's very difficult to design for more than one source of fire. Um, but I think it's absolutely critical that if you know your building is potentially going to suffer arson or there's a high likelihood, then the sort of elements that we get in the design standards that say every building should, every area should have alternative escapes except if it's low risk and there's low numbers of people and it's short distances and maybe when we actually start looking at arson those situations where we would normally accept a single direction of escape should be reviewed to say well that's all well and good but what if that's where the arsonist has set the fire so the fact that there's a, a low number of people and a short distance will not necessarily offset the fact there's a single direction particularly if an accelerant's been used in which case the fire is going to develop much more rapidly in the early stages. A lot of our approach in terms of travel distances, particularly for single direction, is on the basis that they're relatively short because you're moving towards the fire, but you should be aware of the fire relatively quickly in its development. Obviously, if you end up in a system whereby um, the uh, the fire comes along and it's developing much more rapidly, a lot of those assumptions may be different. Sorry, I was just thrown slightly off my slight stride there because I think at long last my webcam decided it might think about working. Right, so the, the issue of arson then is not only a design stage issue in, in general terms, 
it is something to look at in the fire and risk assessment and in doing so consideration should be given to as i say local instances of vandalism local instances of um, arson and also at what is around and about you um here at uh, Lutchen's house for headquarters of CABE we would sort of hope that nobody's got a particular grudge against us and that we're a fairly low risk in terms of somebody um, setting fire to the premises from the point of view of arson please don't if you're watching this get any particular ideas uh, um, but in reality one of the things we do have to consider is that we sit as a premises bang next door to the police station and during the day, any given day, we get numerous people turn up at the front door thinking we are the police station, even though we've got signs all around and all the rest of it. So although we may consider ourselves a low risk in relation to arson, in reality, we may be a high risk in relation to arson by mistake because somebody thinks we're somebody else. So in doing a risk assessment of actual workplace or a building, it's important to think that little bit further outside the box, not just where are you, but where do you sit in relation to your surroundings. Um, so you can talk to crime prevention to talk about what's going on, talk to the fire service to see what sort of incidents they have. Um, practical things like if people are fly tipping, abandoning vehicles, those are key targets of people to set fire to. So again, report all of those and get them removed as soon as possible. Um, and have proper effective precautions in place when closing down and shutting down the premises to make sure that it works. Okay, and really in terms of design, that's pretty much um, all we can do. There is no fundamental additional level of precaution we can put in. So, um, we only seem to have had the one question so far. Are there any further questions from anybody? Okay, quite a, quite a quiet audience today then, Katie. Yeah, definitely. I think what I'll do, Kevin, is if, if we just give people a couple of minutes if they've got any questions to submit them. But in the meantime, what I'll do is say to everybody that we're now looking at announcing our uh, schedule for the webinar Wednesday for sort of uh, the autumn. So in September, we'll be, having, we'll be hosting a webinar on safety outdoor events. Now, this was the one that we rescheduled um, because of the, the nature of the timing of, of when we're originally going to run it. So we've dropped that one into September. October, we're going to run testing for compliance. November will be accessibility in commercial buildings. And then December, we're actually going to look at the natural environment um, and barriers to development. What I'll do is I'll, a, I'll drop an email out to you all, um, thanking you for obviously attending this morning and confirming the CPD element. But then I'll also include links to these events if you want to, uh, to register straight on. So uh, it will obviously be great if you can join us um, for those ones. But again, as we always say, if there's any topics that you want covering, just let us know, drop us an email, give us a ring, however you want to get in touch with us. And we'll obviously be looking at uh, further content moving into next year. Okay. So I'm just seeing, looking what's coming in now. A few, yeah. um, no, that, in. <laughs> okay. Um, no, so thank you very much for the comments that are coming in. Um, thank you for listening today. And as Katie says, we'll see you for the next one in September. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your time and uh, expertise again, Kevin. Again, the comments that are coming in are just um, comments regarding the actual content and the presentation, what have you. So we see there's no further questions. So on that note, we shall say goodbye and see you in September. Thank you.